Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video and the next, we're going to be talking about cranial nerve 5, which is the trigeminal nerve. The trigeminal nerve is a little more complicated than most cranial nerves because it has both sensory and motor components. And because of that, we're going to break this into two videos. In this one, we're going to talk about the sensory parts of the trigeminal nerve. And the next video, we're going to talk more about the motor parts. Let's first talk about the sensory component of the trigeminal nerve. The trigeminal nerve is going to receive sensory information really from the head and the face. And you see here in color the regions that it senses. Now you'll notice that there are three differently colored regions, and these correspond to the three components of the trigeminal nerve. This is why it's a little bit complicated. As the trigeminal nerve is moving peripherally from the pons, which is where it originates, it enlarges into this trigeminal ganglion, which you see right here. And then the trigeminal ganglion gives off three separate nerves, which are like subnerves of the trigeminal nerve and they're usually labeled V1, V2, and V3. And the V comes from the fact that the trigeminal nerve is cranial nerve 5, and the Roman numeral 5 is a V. So V1 is the ophthalmic nerve. This region in yellow right here is the region of the head and face sensed by the ophthalmic nerve. V2 is the maxillary nerve. This region in orange or red, this is the region sensed by V2, which is the maxillary nerve. And then the last one, V3, is the mandibular nerve. This is the region sensed by the mandibular nerve in green. And when we talk about these three divisions of the trigeminal nerve, it's important to understand that V1 and V2, the ophthalmic and maxillary nerves, are sensory only. They have no motor components whereas the mandibular nerve V3 has both sensory and motor components, and those motor components are what we're going to be covering in the next video. Let's first think about V1, the ophthalmic nerve, and when we go through this diagram over here, remember that sensory information is traveling from the periphery toward the trigeminal ganglion, but we're going to talk about it in the reverse direction. So from the trigeminal ganglion, we have that first division, which is the ophthalmic nerve. The ophthalmic nerve itself has three branches. The top one is the frontal nerve, the middle one is the lacrimal nerve, and the bottom one is the nasociliary nerve. The frontal nerve itself has two divisions. SO is supraorbital, and ST is supratrochlear. Then if we look at the lacrimal nerve, it does not have any divisions. It continues on as the lacrimal nerve. The nasociliary nerve has three major branches. The IT would be infratrochlear, just like ST is supratrochlear. AE is anterior ethmoidal, and you can guess PE would be posterior ethmoidal. Regardless, all three of these branches, the frontal nerve, the lacrimal nerve, and nasociliary nerve, relay information back here to the ophthalmic nerve where they converge, and then that leads back into the trigeminal ganglion. Next is V2, the maxillary nerve. You can see here that the region that it senses is just lateral to the eyes and the forehead, and also the maxillary region, as you might expect, and really the uh, top half of the mouth, the upper lips, the upper teeth and gums, and so on and so forth. So with V2, as it continues, it really just changes names to the infraorbital nerve. And you can see that it gives off here a bunch of little tiny branches. This one right here for Z, this is the zygomatic branch. And then you can see a bunch of little branches that go down towards the teeth. These are the superior alveolar nerves. And they sort of anastomose right here, you could think of it that way, and form a plexus called the superior dental plexus, which is right around the area of the gums and the teeth, that is the upper gums and teeth. That's your maxillary nerve V2. Now remember, V1 and V2 are purely sensory in function. V3, or the mandibular nerve, in contrast, is both sensory and motor. And you can see that it really goes towards the mandible, as you might expect, and really the lower half of the mouth, lower teeth, lower gums, lower lip, all that. Okay, and a little bit of the ear. So V3 is going to give off a bunch of larger branches. Okay, 
The first one that comes off here is the buccal nerve. Now, if you've seen the video over the facial nerve, and we talked about the facial nerve branches, so for cranial nerve seven, there was a buccal branch. This is different from that. This is the actual buccal nerve, which comes off of V3 of the trigeminal nerve. Okay, so they both have one of similar names. Over here, we have the auriculotemporal nerve. This is actually the nerve that's gonna provide sensation for this upper half of the ear. Okay, auriculotemporal nerve. The next one that comes off is the lingual nerve. The lingual nerve, as you might expect, goes toward the tongue. This one that comes off here, this is the inferior alveolar nerve. And you can imagine this is really going towards uh, the lower gums, the lower teeth, right? And then as it continues, it terminates as the mental nerve, which is going towards the bottom of the chin right here. All of these branches of V3 that I've talked about up to this point are all sensory. But this last one, the mylohyoid nerve, this is the only one shown here that is motor. And as you might expect, it's going to innervate the mylohyoid muscle, but it also innervates the anterior belly of the digastric muscle. So this right here is all the sensation of the trigeminal nerve. Regardless of what receptive field or area we're talking about, they all relay that sensory information back to their respective branches, either V1, V2, or V3. And then those three branches send their information back through the trigeminal ganglion, back to the trigeminal nerve, which ultimately goes back to the pons. Let's actually see how that works. So in red here, I have motor. We're not looking at that yet. We're only looking at the gold sensory parts. So this is a skull here, but again, you can kind of get the idea. V1's up here, that's the ophthalmic nerve. V2 is the maxillary nerve, and V3 right here, at least the sensory part, that's the mandibular nerve. All of those are going back to this trigeminal ganglion. That's that engorgement of the trigeminal nerve. Now the trigeminal ganglion is very close to the pons. We'll come back to this picture in a minute, but look, that trigeminal ganglion is really close to the pons, right? In any case, the trigeminal ganglion connects with the pons. You see the axons moving into the pons right here, but notice, instead of going directly up to the brain, they're actually going to initially descend, and they're gonna descend down to this structure right here, which is called the spinal nucleus of cranial nerve five. And this is where they're gonna synapse with this second order neuron. Now notice in this example, we're talking about the trigeminal ganglion on the left side, okay, the left side of the pons. So these axons are gonna enter the left side of the pons, descend down to the left medulla, and that's where they're gonna synapse with the second order neuron within the left spinal nucleus of cranial nerve five. Now the second order neuron here is then going to decussate. It's gonna cross over to the other side while still in the medulla. And then those axons of the second order neurons then ascend up into the pons and then up into the midbrain and all the way up into the thalamus, which is right here. Now this right here is a special nucleus within the thalamus. It's called the ventroposteromedial nucleus or VPM nucleus of the thalamus. And then here in the VPM nucleus, this is where the second order neuron synapses with the third order neuron, which then its axons move up through the internal capsule and up to the somatosensory cortex, which is where perception of physical sensation occurs. Notice in the case of the sensory component of the trigeminal nerve, we have a three neuron system like we usually do in sensation. We start with that first order neuron, which goes from the face and head itself through the trigeminal ganglion and then descends down here in the pons to the spinal nucleus of cranial nerve five. Then we have that second order neuron, which goes from the spinal nucleus of cranial nerve five, decussates and ascends all the way up to the VPM nucleus of the thalamus, and then a third order neuron, which goes from the thalamus up to the somatosensory cortex. When we look at the motor part of the trigeminal nerve later on in the next video, we'll see this is a two neuron system with an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron. Let's look at this again with a different picture. So here's our trigeminal ganglion. We have these three things coming off of it. These are receiving input from V1, V2, and V3. 
we follow these neurons in, they go into the pons, and then immediately descend down to that spinal nucleus of cranial nerve 5. This is where they synapse with second order neurons, which immediately decussate at the level of the medulla, and then again rise up going through the contralateral side. Okay? As they rise up through the brainstem, this is actually termed the trigeminal lemniscus, and we go over this in a little more detail in another video. I'll try to remember to put the link in the description. But the trigeminal lemniscus that keeps ascending upward from the pons through the midbrain, and eventually we get to the thalamus. And this right here, where you see the second order neurons synapsing with these third order neurons, that's in a part of the thalamus, which was the ventral posteromedial or VPM nucleus. And then those third order neurons then move uh, from the thalamus through the internal capsule to a specific part of the somatosensory area that's responsible for perceiving sensation in the head and the face. You'll notice that for the head and the face, the region of sensation in that somatosensory area is much more lateral. It's on the side. If we think about the top here, this would be a lot more for like the torso, the arms, and the legs, and even going down into here, into the fissure. But on the lateral aspects here for both the motor and the sensory homunculus, uh, this area is really for the head and the face. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the sensory component of the trigeminal nerve. In the next video, we're going to do the same thing but for the motor components. So see you then. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.